before we, uh, we're going to look at James chapter 1, uh, the second part of it, from verse 13 on <laughs> to verse 27. But before we do that, I want to share two things. That's got nothing to do with it. <laughs> First is about us and about worship. And that's this. In your worship, never hesitate to proclaim, My name, says the Lord. Yes. For as you proclaim my name, you proclaim my presence within you. And as you proclaim my presence within you, you proclaim that we are in unity and union. And that's what matters in church. Yes. Amen. Amen. And the second thing I want to talk about, I'll share, is... Are you troubled by what is happening today? War in the Middle East, threats to our civilization, threats just, not just from nations, but also from ideologies. Let's look at what David says in the psalm. Psalm 37, and verse 34 to 38 says this, don't be impatient for the Lord to act. <laughs> Keep travelling steadily along his pathway, and in due season he will honour you with every blessing, and you will see the wicked destroyed. I, David says, I myself have seen it happen. A proud and evil man, towering like a cedar of Lebanon, but when I looked again, he was gone. I searched, but could not find him. But the good man, what a different story. For God, for the good man, the blameless, the upright, the man of peace, he has a wonderful future ahead of him. For him, there is a happy ending but evil men shall be destroyed and their posterity shall be cut off David knew all about it he tells us about the wicked being destroyed and tells us what he's seen and he wants to encourage us that God is in charge we have a wonderful future and a happy ending. Don't look at the present, but look forward to what God has promised us. Amen. 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 So we're going to look at um, James chapter 1, part 2. Uh, and I'll just read it out to you from verse 13 to 27. It says, When tempted... No one should say, God is tempting me. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when, by his own evil desire, he is dragged away and enticed. Then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. Don't be deceived, my brothers. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. He chose to give us birth through the word of truth, that we might be the kind of first fruits of all he created. My dear brothers, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. For man's anger does not bring about the righteous life that God desires. Therefore, get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent and humbly accept the word planted in you, which can save you. Do not merely listen to the word 
and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Amen. Anyone who listens to the word and does not do it, what it do, does not do what it says, is like a man who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself, goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. <laughs> but the man who looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues to do this, not forgetting what he has heard, but doing it, he will be blessed in what he does. If anyone considers himself religious and yet does not keep a tight rein on his tongue, he deceives himself and his religion is worthless. Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this. To look after the orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. Amen. Uh, can you put up the little thing, Peter? The little... Oh, there we are. This is just a summary so you can know what I'm going through. I've got a text, because I always like texts mm -hmm. to remind us what, you know, we've been looking at. And James 1.23 says this, do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Do what it says. So we're going to look at seven things here. How trials and temptations come and how they work. God's goodness in contrast to the temptations we face. Standing firm against unrighteous anger. Oh, put it on twice. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I'll tell you what it says. Must be important. <laughs> Be, being doers of the word. Sorry, stand even. Being doers of the word. The biggest problem we face, our ability to keep our mouth shut. And examples of what it means to be a doer of the word of God. So we'll start with the first one. How trials and temptations come, and how they work. Anybody not had a trial or temptation? <laughs> Anybody want to put their hand up? Because, mm -hmm. you know, you're, you, you're unusual if you are. It says in 13 to 16, When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when... By his own evil desire, he is dragged away and enticed. Then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. Let's understand that what we are, we are like, and what the Bible tells us regarding our nature. Jeremiah 17 and verse 9 says this, The heart is deceitful above all things, and beyond cure. We, who can understand it? We fool ourselves when we believe that we are not desperately wicked. We have just seen how wicked man can be, mankind can be on October the 7th. What I'm saying is that while we behave well and appear so good, we are, also in, we are also capable of not so nice things. We look at children and think how wonderful they are. And they are. Yet we do not have to teach even the youngest to be naughty. They do it all by themselves. <laughs> <laughs> Christian teaching observes that we have an inbuilt bias. This teaching is called original sin. And it has two parts to it. Original guilt and original pollution. This is about our original guilt is about our nature, our sin, and how it relates to God's justice. Let me read you from Romans 5. It's in verse 12 it says, 
to 19. Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man, and death through sin, and in this way death came to all men, because, because all sin, for before the law was given, sin was in the world. But sin is not taken into account when there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from the time of Adam to the time of Moses. Even those who did not sin by breaking a command, as did Adam, who was the pattern of the one to come. But the gift is not like the trespass. For if the many died by the trespass of one man, how much more did God's grace and the gift that came by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, overflow to many? Again, the gift of God is not like the result of one man's sin. The judgment followed what one sin and brought condemnation. But the gift followed by many trespasses and brought, and brought justification. For if by the trespass of the one man death reigned through that one man, how much more will those who receive God's abundant provision of grace and the gift of righteousness reign in life through the, the one man, Jesus Christ. Consequently, just as the result of one trespass was condemnation for all men, so also the result of one act of righteousness was justification that brings life for all men. Amen. For just as through, all, through the disobedience of that one man, the many were made sinners, so also through, also through the obedience of that one man, the many will be made righteous. Guilt can be removed by true repentance and a faith which substantively justifies us before God, based upon the work of the Lord Jesus in appeasing the anger of God regarding our sin. Original pollution is not just about the absence of righteous, original righteousness, but it's also about positive evil. We have a disposition towards sin. Man has a total depravity and has also a total inability to alter our nature. No matter what you like, it comes. You, you've only got to let it in and it will be there. Sin is like that. James 3, 1 and verse 13 to 16. When tempted, no one should say God is tempting me, for God cannot be tempted. But each one is tempted when by his own desire he is dragged away and enticed. Then after desire is conceived, in our minds, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it's full grown, gives birth to death. It comes in the mind. God sometimes allows great tests to come to his people. Even some who might be thought as his favourites. We think of the affliction he allowed to come to Job. Job was a righteous man, it said, he says in the scriptures. And yet he went through everything. The tempting of Job was not just from the God, but he was allowed by God. Satan tempts. God tries. The same trial can be a temptation and a trial. It may be a trial from God's side and a temptation from Satan's side. Because Satan wants to do us down. Just as Job suffered from Satan, it was a temptation. He also suffered from God through Satan. It was a trial. Sin is an inside job. James says it starts with the mind when each one is tempted when by his own evil desire. 1 John 2 and verse 6 says, For everything in the world, the cravings of sinful man, the lust of his eyes, and the boasting of what he has and does, comes not from the Father, but from the world. And the world and its desires pass away. But the man who does the will of God lives forever. 
You see, it starts in the mind. It's an inside job. How you rule your mind decides how your life is. A few months ago, I talked about Thomas Kempis in his book, The Imitation of Christ, who talks about the presence of God and he talks about practicing the presence of God. The best, the presence of God is the best antidote to sin in our lives. And the presence of God focuses our mind and changes us from one degree of glory to another. That's what God wants us to be like. Now, God's goodness stands in contrast to the temptations we face. Every good and perfect gift, it says, is from above, and cometh down from the Father of lights, whom he, who, with whom there is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. He chose to give us birth through the word of truth. Every good and perfect gift is from above. God does not give imperfect gifts. We can expect no true goodness from our fallen natures and from those who would entice us <coughs> away from God. But every good and every perfect gift comes from God the Father. Of course, there are some... The ultimate goodness of any gift must be measured on an eternal scale. Something that may seem only good, such as coming into a large amount of money, may in fact turn out to be our, dis our destruction. Yeah. God is the father of lights, it says. There is no shadow from God himself as, as he is light himself. Shadows only occur away from light. And therefore, God cannot cast a shadow. God's goodness is constant. It says, with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. In the King James. Among modern theologians, there are some who are taken with something what is called process theology. Which says that God is maturing and growing and in process himself. Wow. No variation means he does not change. He is therefore not maturing or growing. Modern theology and theologians get it wrong. It says in James 1.18, He chose to give us birth through the word of truth that we might be the first fruits of all he created. James understood that the gift of salvation given by God are not earned, is not earned by the work or the obedience of man. It is his own trial. It is his own will that he is brought forth for our salvation. God shows us. He wants us. It's nice to be wanted. <laughs> Standing firm against the lust of the flesh. Ooh. Therefore, get rid of all moral filth, it says in verse 21, and the evil that is so prevalent, and humbly accept the word planted in you, which can save you. It says get rid of all the moral filth and evil that is so prevalent. And it is prevalent. You've only got to walk down the road You've only got to go see the TV. And it's prevalent. And it's moral filth. Both in terms of individuals and ourselves and societies, we need to live lives that are absence of immoral living and evil intent. Immoral living not only affects us, but it affects society. Society can be easily led down immoral ways on the basis of 
It's people's freedom of choice. Freedom of expression. From there, evil can become acceptable. <coughs> it is about impure and an impure manner of living. In the light of, new, of nature, of temptation and the goodness of God, we are to lay aside all impurity and put it far from us. <coughs> 120. The last little bit of that verse is, and humbly accept the word planted in you which can save you. Receive with meekness, it says in another version, the implanted word. In contrast to the impure manner of living, we have to receive the implanted word of God, which changes us. Meekness means and reflects a teachable heart. The implanted word is to save us both in our current situation and eternally. The implanted word is able to save us even now in this impure age. <coughs> Being doers of the word, oh, this is one that cuts to the chase. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves, it says in 22 to 25. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not look, do what it says is like a man who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself, goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But the man who looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues to do this, not forgetting what he has heard, but doing it, he will be blessed in what he does. We must receive God's word as doers, not merely hearers. If we don't do what God's word says, then we're deceiving ourselves. We may be deceiving ourselves even regarding our salvation. God's word must affect our whole being and change us to be more like Jesus. The advantage of being doers is that James tells us we will be blessed. Remember a few weeks ago I said, Doctrine is taught not just to be heard, but that it may change us. Jesus is looking for disciples, doers, not merely hearers. Jesus on the Sermon on the Mount said that one that the one who heard the word without joining it was like a man who built his house <coughs> on sand. The well, one who heard God's word and did it was like a man whose house was built on a rock. The one, who both, the one who both heard and did God's word could withstand the inevitable storms of life and the judgment of eternity. Spurgeon said, told the story of Donald, who'd come from the Kirk, that's the church in Scotland, sooner than usual. Sandy said to him, what is the matter, Donald? Is the sermon all done? No, said Donald. It's all said, but it's not begun to be done yet. <laughs> Anyone who listens to the word and does not do it is like a man who looks it like his face in a mirror. And after looking at himself, goes away and forgets what he looks like. Here, it really means we look at the mirror and we take a careful scrutiny of what our face is like so that we can't deceive ourselves. We need to look at what we're like so we can see and change what we are like. <clears throat> now here's the biggest problem, our inability to keep our mouths shut. <laughs> if anyone considers himself religious and yet does not keep tight rein on his 
tongue, he deceives himself and his religion is worthless. A tight rein here is as a horse is restrained by a bridle. James talks here of someone who is religious, but is not really right with God. And the result is someone who does not bridle his tongue. James just explained that religion is not just shown about hearing the word, but doing it. One way to do God's word is to do it and not just talk about doing it. Let me tell you, show you an example. Some examples of what it means to be a doer of the word of God. Religion, it says in verse 27, that our God the Father accepts pure and falsely is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted from the world. There is a great deal of pure and undefiled in religion in the sight of man that is not pure and undefiled religion before God. James says, to visit the widows and orphans in their trouble and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. A real walk with God shows itself in simple, practical ways. It helps the needy and keeps itself unstained by the world's corruption. This does not simply mean giving, but actually practical relief. Unspotted from the world, the idea is not that a Christian retreats away from the world, but he does not follow the world. <coughs> from the book of Genesis, Lot is an example of a man who was spotted by the world. He started living towards Sodom, disregarding the spiritual climate of the area because of the prosperity of the area. Eventually, he moved to the wicked city, and it was wicked. Don't get me wrong. The people in there, when the angels came, said, Oh, let us out. We want to have sex with them. That's how bad they were. Even, and he became part of the city's leadership. The end result was that Lot lost everything and was saved only by the skin of his teeth. Here's another example. Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones was the son of a grocer in Wales and went on to be a medical doctor who was an assistant to the King's doctor in the 20s. And he gave it up and became a minister of the gospel. He was the minister at Westminster Chapel in London and preached for 13 years every Friday night to 1500 people on the book of Romans but every Christmas on Boxing Day he opened up the chapel and he and his wife and kids served those who were on the streets with a Boxing Day lunch he was not just here a hearer he was a doer of the word Amen. In summary, trials and temptations come and they affect us. Satan tempts, God tries, but remember, sin is an inside job. And it's all stoked, it starts by our nature if we feed it. God is the father of lights and does not cast the shadow and he wants actively to bring us into his kingdom we need to stand firm against unrighteous anger listening to God and other righteous people brings about righteousness in our lives standing firm against the lust of the flesh in the light of the goodness of God lay aside in pure living and that will save us 
And we need to be hearers of the word together with doing. The big problem we face, again, as I said, is this, this mouth, which can get us into all sorts of trouble. <clears throat> Let's do God's word and not just talk about it. And examples, well, we see them all the time from some people. Martin Lloyd was not just a preacher, but an example of doing God's will. <clears throat> As I've said before, in, James, in the text, do not merely listen to the word and so deceive ourselves. Do what it says. Amen. Amen. Let's just pray. Father, we thank you that you are at both to will, that uh, you are at work within us, both to will and to do of your good pleasure. Father, we want to be your people, and we want to be in a kingdom that will eventually honour you and show the world that what matters is being yours we want to be yours Lord and we're glad we're yours and we want to change to be more like Jesus mm -hmm. so Father we ask that you be with us and you change us on a daily basis making us more like Jesus because it will make a difference in this world mm -hmm. Amen, Amen.